Well, welcome to Tea and Talk Virtual Edition. My name is Leslie Thompson. I am Director of Adult Programs at the Sid Richardson Museum. And before we get into the program, I want to start us off first with a land acknowledgement, which pays tribute to the original inhabitants of the land that we are on. So we, the Sid Richardson Museum, respectfully acknowledge all Native American peoples who have lived on this land since time immemorial. And the Sid would especially like to acknowledge and pay respect to the Wichita and affiliated tribes upon whose historical homeland our museum is located. So today, in addition to members of the museum staff, we have a special guest with us. So I'm gonna go around my screen and introduce each person according to how I see them on my screen. So whenever I say your name, just give a quick wave and hello. Um, so I've got Janie Cumming. Say hello, Janie. Hi. There we go. So, so people can see you. Um, Janie is a, a manager of our visitor services. And then we've got uh, Scott Winterroad. Hello. He is our director of the Sid Richardson Museum. Then I've got Betsy Thomas. Hello. She is director of education resources at the Sid. And then I've got our special guest with us today, Jen J Dr. J.R. Hinneman. Hey, everybody. <laughs> and she is associate curator of the Petrie Institute of Western Art at the Denver Art Museum. And then finally, I've got Shelby Orr. Hi, everybody. And she is director of school and family programs at the SID. Um, and before we get into our discussion or conversation here today, I actually just want to quickly review um, for those who are not familiar with Tea and Talk. Um, this is a program that really provides an opportunity to slow down the art viewing process. I like to think of it as a deep dive into one work of art. Um, you know, studies have shown that the average museum visitor spends maybe 10 to 15 seconds with a work of art. And while that might feel like it's a lot of time if you're standing on your feet all day, um, it's really not a lot of time to take in all of the details um, that an artwork has to offer and really respond to um, what you're seeing before you. Now, normally our in-person program allots about half an hour, um, but for this virtual program, we will keep it down to 10 minutes. And on the screen, I have an image of one of the paintings from our collection. This is a painting by uh, Peter Moran. And we'll be looking at this painting today for our program. Um, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and set my timer for 10 minutes. And while I'm doing that, y'all, if you wanna take a look at this painting and as you um, start noticing something, just share something that you see. Something I'm picking up as soon as I was looking at this painting, it's just kind of like an overall feeling um, of tone. Uh, the color palette just has like this very warm tone to it. Um, and that, that was just immediately um, what I picked up on when I first looked at this. It's a very 19th century brown based earth tone, definitely. But then there's yeah. that one pop of red right in the very middle around which the entire painting revolves. That's a good point. Yeah, so we see, we're see, yeah, we're seeing a lot of brown tones, tan tones, but yeah, as Jared pointed out, there's that bright, bright, like cherry red, um, right in the middle, in the center of the painting where, where your, your attention is drawn to. Yeah. What, what else do you that? notice? What is that? Is that a cape or what is the red What do y'all think? It looks like a bag <laughs> to me. Maybe a blanket or a wrap, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I bet so. It looks like yeah, it looks like something wrapped around him. Yeah. Sorry, Betsy. Oh no, it looks like the the person behind the that main figure maybe has a red one sort of wrapped around them also. Yeah. I see that. I see. And you know, I noticed that one after the first thing I saw was the that, you know, the one we were talking about, the bigger piece. And then you start looking and you, you see that little red there behind it. And then there's a little red on this uh, teepee over here. Over to the left, the big teepee, that little yeah, square. Yeah, it's subtle. Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I it's like, you're, you're, oh yeah, you're like your eyes being moved around by these little pops of, of right. red. Right, right. Yeah. 
Well, and I think that's something too, we've, we've noted that it's lots of earthy tones uh, with these pops of red, but it takes you a while to, it's a slow burn. It really takes you a while you start to get sucked in by these little details that on first pass you don't see. And then you start to see, you know, little things inside the these mounds and, and huts and uh, things start to pop out at you after you spend time with it. Yes, yeah. It's such an intimate space to the way Marana has composed the painting. It's really all about foreground. And it's so interesting to think about we're in the middle of this group of people and horses in contrast to the work that his brothers, Edward and Thomas Moran produced, which is all about vista, big expansive spaces. But Peter Moran, who holds us in this circle, a circle of teepees, a circle of horse butts, and then just this, this figure in red in the middle with a, a white horse and a foal uh, doing something not, it, not it's not clear what's happening, right? Which is an interesting part of that mystery where he, he's pulling us in and yet he's not, and, and this painting is very much about detail and yet it's not really clear what the, if there's a narrative, if there's a story, what exactly is going on here. Right, yeah. And, and JR is referencing um, the Moran brothers, for those of you who might be familiar with the Hudson River School, especially Thomas Moran. Um, was a, a famous landscape artist who yeah, creates these really epic paintings. Um, and here you've got Peter Rand really doing kind of a close up of a really intimate scene. Yeah. What else do you notice? I'm wondering, oh, sorry, Scott. Oh, go ahead, you go ahead. I just said, I'm wondering, um, I never really thought about it before, but some of the people are on horses and I don't, I wonder if they're coming back from being somewhere or if they're on their way out? The couple, the people in the back? Um, sort of in the middle. It looks like they're on horses. Mm -hmm. And, and it, I just kind of wonder like if they're coming back from, from somewhere or if they're about to set out. Yeah, what, what is the timeline there? Yeah. And that's kind of, I think what I was headed towards is like, you know, there's more horses than there are people. So it's kind of, like what are we looking at here and it's like it feels like we're in an area where they're stabling the horses I don't know it, and I, to Betsy's question are they coming back are they going I don't know but it's it's a lot of horses <laughs> <laughs> notice how long the shadows are which implies it's either morning or evening so mm -hmm. it could equally be coming or going exactly yeah noticing time of day here it's yeah, also, yeah. I mean, in general, it's a very interesting setting too, um, where you've got these teepees that are at various stages of like put together yeah. and in production and the, the structures themselves are very unusual. I mean, I'm not necessarily, I'm not an expert on teepees, um, but I've never seen any depicted with branches. Um, it, it's very, different. <laughs> it also makes me question the scale, like what, what's the use of the different structures because they're they're so varied and also what's happening in that foreground right area where it looks like they've got materials to build something else because it, it's oh, very yeah. resemblant of the, the understructure of the other teepees and then there's other materials in there that I can't exactly recognize nor can I see because of our faces right now but um, <laughs> but it's interesting. I mean it's it's a uh, it's very complex. Also, I'm, I'm drawn to these teepees because I'm, I'm drawn to that first one, which is appearing more and more blue at the top, whereas the others have more of a, a feel of the, the fur or the hide is still there at the top of the teepees. That's an interesting interpretation. I, I've, I've noticed those colors, the tips before, um, and because I, the blue was there, I just thought, it was just an opportunity to add in more color, but your idea of maybe they're still part of the hide, um, the fur on the hide um, as a possibility. I hadn't thought of that before. At this point in time, those might be canvas teepees. I mean, this, is, this is something I really struggle with with Western American art because so the details are so important, but they are often completely fabricated. And so I have, we, we are, we're raising these questions about 
well, what kind of a structure is that? And is it being built or taken down? And what is it made out of? And why is it painted that way? And which all of which are, fan, are great research questions to ask and to follow. The answer could simply be because Peter Moran wanted them to look like that. Right, yeah. This could be based off imagination more than reality. Well, I mean, we know he traveled in the West a lot, but these are, this, this is both the, I guess this is the tension for me. I, I see all these details as fact, but, but the joy is in discovering, are they factual? And what could a scene like this tell us about indigenous life at this point in time? And then what, what is it telling us that is in fact not truth, but artistic license? Right. And we've already talked about the red. I mean, that's artistic license. So we know there's this, he's structuring the composition. So exactly um, what's real, what's not, yes. Right, yeah. Huh. Janie, were you gonna say something? Um, I was, I, I was gonna say that to me, uh, and of course this is way, way back there, but it, it has a coming home feel to me. Hmm. I don't know, and I don't know why I can't, really articulate why but it just it just feels like that to me it feels like you know the this woman over here by that first tp on the left mm -hmm. looks very relaxed like i don't know end of the day maybe and um i don't know maybe it's the the light or the color yeah i'm wondering because i have a, a kind of a, a vague feeling similar to that as well of like mm -hmm. maybe it's going back to this like i picked up at first sight, the warmth um, of the painting, which kind of gives, kind of sets the mood a little bit. Um, and it's like also soft in a way. Um, and although there is action technically taking place, um, it's kind of subdued, or I mean, I guess the action itself has been subdued, <laughs> uh, depending on how you interpret that. Um, and, and everyone else is pretty still. It's, it's just very, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it's not uh, in your face, I guess. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering, and this is just me putting my own meaning in it, the, the white horse at the center, if, if they've just caught some of these horses and maybe he's trying to sort of break it mm -hmm. or, or subdue it. Um, since we noticed there are a lot of horses, if maybe they're bringing back some, I don't know. Yeah, trying to tame some wild horses, perhaps, because you also see there's a couple horses in the far left background who aren't um, tied up. So maybe maybe they've already been tamed. Who knows? <laughs> because, what else do you notice? <laughs> because we drew our attention to that figure um, on the far left seated, I'm now noticing that very strange shadow that is in the foreground of the painting that I guess implies some sort of a tree outside of the picture plane. But it, it's again compositional in the way that it makes our eyes move across the whole of the painting um, and those light areas that are surrounded by much more crisp shadows amongst the horses and figures. Mm, yeah. So again, yeah, looking at the composition and how he's drawing our eye around um, in certain areas. There's so much. There's so much more. Uh, I'd like to dig into this painting. We actually reached our 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so that uh, you can see that really even 10 minutes is not enough time to <laughs> really get to know a painting. Um, uh, and also, you know, obviously when you're able to, I encourage you to, to look at art in person because there are some details that are kind of hard to pick up um, looking at this through a screen. Um, you know, we've mentioned that this is a painting by Peter Moran, who is the brother of, of Thomas Moran. And um, this painting is titled Indian Encampment, um, which, you know, we've kind of understood uh, that to be the case here. Um, and there's not a set date on this painting. It's um, been given uh, circa 1880 to 1881, um, which is a, right after he's traveled west uh, with his brother, like J.R. was mentioning. Um, and he does eventually in 1890, um, along with another artist, Gilbert Gall, in our collection, um, he is part of this uh, the 1890 census where he travels out to record um, American Indians in the West. Um, so the, we know that he, he knows the reality um, of, of what's going on, what the situation is with um, reservations. Um, so it's, 
Yeah, it's really not having a, a date set on this. It's kind of unclear as to where he is in this understanding um, of the realities um, uh, for indigenous peoples in the American West. Um, and if that really is important to him um, for the sake of this painting and what his intentions are here. So uh, a lot of questions left unanswered, um, but still quite a, a beautiful uh, work to look at. And, and for those who are watching this, um, we would love to hear from you if there's if there's anything you notice in this painting, if there's details that we haven't gotten to or questions that this provokes for you, um, please do leave them in the comments below for us. We'd, we'd like to keep the conversation going. Um, but with that, I'm gonna thank y'all for joining us for a tea and talk today. This was a lot of fun. So thank you. <laughs>